So I had leadership aspirations already, right? I wanted to be a leader. So I sort of put myself up for prefect, you know, um, didn't get it. And I remember like either the principal or, the, or one of the teachers, and I asked him, I said, can you give me some feedback? Well, you know, I just want to know what happened. And he said to me, and I remember this to this day, to the day I die, he said to me, he goes, mate, Asians have no leadership skills. That's what he said to me. Before we get started on today's episode, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the land of the Darug people. We would like to acknowledge and pay respects to our elders past and present and the next generation coming through. Now onto today's episode. We're joined today by Jay Yong Lo, who is the founding director of the Center for Asian Australian Leadership at the Australian National University. As an experienced advocate, innovator, and change maker, Jay Yong has worked across the not for profit, community, sport, government, higher education, and entrepreneurship sectors. For many years, he has focused on advancing ethnic and cultural diversity in Australia, and in particular, addressing the bamboo ceiling and elevating emerging Asian Australian leaders to the public sphere and addressing the significant underrepresentation of Asian Australians in senior leadership positions. Jay Yong is a leading voice on cultural diversity, diverse representation and inclusive leadership. His mission and purpose are to create platforms and opportunities to showcase the experience, expertise and talents of Asian Australian leaders, build and consolidate the Asian Australian ecosystem and supporting Asian Australian professionals and entrepreneurs to reach the leadership potential and achieve their career aspirations. In this episode, we talk to Jay Young about being a Bijan student, his diplomat aspirations and career highlights, and what the future holds for Asian Australians. Jay Young also speaks to us about the meaning behind his Chinese name and leaves us with some words of wisdom for the younger generation. Enjoy the episode. How do you feel the how the awards went, you know, last night, 40 under 40? Oh, uh, you know, I think it was great just to have everybody in the same room because yeah. this event was three years in the making. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because yeah. we had the first event in Melbourne. So Melbourne in 2019 was the inaugural awards and the inaugural Asian Australian Leadership Summit. And we thought, you know, it was a great event uh, at that time, pre-COVID, yeah. you know, who knew the world was going to turn upside down? And then we thought, you know what? And then we had all these people come down, you know, you know, getting recognized yep. for the first batch of the awards, the first 40. And then obviously, you know, typical Sydney siders, they're like, hey, you're going to come up to Sydney? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, all right, you know, sure, you know, happy to. And then 2020, we had a plan, you know, and obviously we talked- Oh, it was already in the works. Oh, it's in the works. So we yeah. had a plan to do it in Sydney. And then obviously with COVID. Yeah. Um, and then, um, then, okay, scrap that off. 2021 so it's 2021 we're like all right because 2020 was dull like we did it online you know like oh you did i was gonna ask you did you do like a online version of we it we did we did it online oh, you version. Did? yeah mm -hmm. and then i was very hard to get excited you know like, so yeah. it's like hey the winner is blind <laughs> everyone's like <laughs> you know like With huge, a microphone yeah, and, and like confetti so you can't, you can't all clap you can't all clap so you can't have you can't have everybody unmute and then clap and it's like Who's Moments clapping? over, man. Yeah. Who's clapping? You know, like what happens if you're buffering or something? You know, it's like you know, you come in late or early. You know, so so that was really strange. It was hard to build momentum, right? right. Okay. 2021, we thought, okay, fine. 2020 was hard year, yeah. and then 2021, let's do this Sydney again, right? Then we started talking about venues and all that, <laughs> and then we're like, oh crap, Omicron, right? You know, like Omicron comes in Delta, <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah. All these like you know different next variations, waves. next waves. Okay, fine. And here we are, 2022, finally. Oh, three years. Three years, you know, mm. like, and just having everybody in the room for me was great. Nothing is perfect execution, mm. but I love this, at the end of the day, like, I just enjoyed just seeing everybody, both of you, mm -hmm. all, you know, all your team and others who, so, who are part of the ecosystem, you know, who are doing amazing things. And I certainly hope that you guys, please, next year, whatever it is, put your names in, you know, I'd love to see yeah. Viv as well, you know, like just, you know, I, I think it's great to be able to sort of, be a part of that, you know, and also be there to support each other and celebrate each other's wins, mm. but also be there when we sort of face, you know, face obstacles and barriers. You it's know? both ways, so isn't it? It is both ways. Yeah. You need that sort of both, you need that encouragement, right? Yeah. And you sort of need that ability, that ecosystem, it's so important because you you always feel like you're alone sometimes because you're pushing mm. up shit creek yeah. and you're creating change. And, you know, you realize that you can't do it alone. Yeah. And that's the one thing that I get reassurance. Mm. Just for context though, for yeah. listeners, um, what is the 40 under 40 most influential Asian Australian award? If the yeah. name doesn't say it for itself. Yeah, well, I mean, like the the, the awards um, uh, was established in 2019 um, by uh, the four original co-founders, um, which was uh, ANU. Mm -hmm. uh, this was before the Centre for Asian Australian Leadership. So mm. the first 40 under 40 awards and the first Asian Australian Leadership Summit 
preceded ANU, so a preceded Cal. So okay. like, you know, so the reason why our Center for Asian Australian Leadership, or we affectionately call this Cal, was launched in 2020 was on the back of the success of the first leadership summit, mm-hmm. Asian Australian Leadership Summit, and the first awards. Mm. So it was co so it was founded at, by a group uh, that included ANU, mm. which I was an employee of at the time, uh, PwC. Uh, Asia Link at the University of Melbourne and mm-hmm. Johnson Partners. Mm-hmm. Um, now we have three co-founders. Um, PwC decided to uh, withdraw mm-hmm. uh, from from the awards, and now it's just a, yeah, th- three of us. Trifecta. But also the the, yeah. pers- the purpose of the awards is to shine a light on um, yeah the incredible achievements and accomplishments of Asian Australians, mm-hmm. reminding people that leadership comes in many forms, not just what we see, not just what we think, as constitutes as effective leadership. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in people's views um, in Australia about leadership, I feel like people find that it's the Captain America style of leadership, you know. One S- person leading from the mm. front. Six foot thing. four with, you know, really <laughs> cheesy lines to try and get people together. You know, I mean, oh, you know, with that personality and that us and that sort of gravitas. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's what people's perception is of leadership. Oh, this person has great personality they must be a good leader you know mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. so and i think you know what we want to show is that it comes in many forms there are different personalities and there are different approaches to what constitutes as good leadership if you are good at data analysis or like the technical part of, of side of things that doesn't mean you're not a good leader of course it is it means that you're a good leader you know you've got leadership potential and leadership mm-hmm. qualities but these qualities are not celebrated mm-hmm. they're not really appreciated as much as we hope also, one of the biggest motivators for these awards is if you look at all the other awards that exist, plenty of them, which I won't name, we all know what they are, <laughs> plenty of them, you would hardly find an Asian face. Yeah. Right. It's true. You know, very hard. So, and so we say to ourselves, going back to the, the mantra that you guys talk about with mm. Level Asian, um, building your own house, mm. you know what I mean? And then we built our own thing and created a space where Asian Australians can be themselves. Mm actually you know connect with others within the ecosystem learn about each other's work in each of the professions there's now i think 11 categories Mm. um and actually be authentic be real they don't have to conform to something that they're not and that was one of the biggest motivators for me personally is to create this platform where they could stand equally as compared to the other awards. And mm. I think we're getting there. I think, you know, it's, it's now in its fourth year, it's continuing. People, people doubted us, you know, when we started in 2019, people were like, oh, just Asian Australians. Can you even find 40 every year? Oh, wow. You know I mean? people, nice. Yeah, people were doubting. Can you keep going? Can you, am I, uh, yeah, like, there's like, at the time it was like, <laughs> You know, thirteen percent of the Australian population mm-hmm. that has an Asian heritage. Oh yeah, we can find it's people. Not hard, yeah. It's not hard. That's the real problem that we have right now, is organisations and leaders. Uh, you know, when you ask them questions about, hey, do you want? You know, what's your take on improving greater representation? Oh yeah, we want to do it, but we can't find people. Mm. You know, to me, that's just lazy. Yeah, there I are, think pe- it's just there not are people out there. Enough, not it? trying hard enough. Yeah, you know? and and that's what that's the challenge that I pose to senior leaders. Yeah, be more active. Mm. Look, look further. You know, look harder. They're out there. Yeah, look exactly right, Viv. Look harder. They're out yeah. there. It's often not like the sort of the loudest chess beater is the mm. one that gets noticed the most, right? Particularly, I think Asians. You know, if we're sort of falling into stereotypes, a lot of that is to do with probably us being the quiet achievers. Mm-hmm. You know, the sort of model yeah. minority, and then therefore you know sort of falls under people's radars. You know, as opposed to just you know being right blatantly in front of people. Mm. Um, so I think from a cultural standpoint and the way we sort of conduct ourselves, you know, I think we have a part to play also in terms of putting ourselves forward and Mm. like if you sort of build a proverbial house with the awards that's it gives people the opportunity because i think even when it first came across my radar at the time and that was 2019 the very Mm. first one um i i discovered it when because i follow adam leor and he was Mm. the keynote speaker for that first Mm. um, and that's i was like i couldn't even fathom or believe that there was an award uh an entire award based on Asian Australians. Mm, and mm. I think it was the first time that I really thought about this as not just from an award standpoint, but just like, hey, there's this movement going on um, about more representation for Asian Australians in general and then how leadership is and everything else that comes with it as well. So I think that's what makes it sort of um, so unique and what makes Australia great, you know, like if I can borrow that word, what makes Australia great, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and that is that we can be ourselves, yeah. you know, like we, we, we can actually be Australian and Asian at the same time. We don't have to choose. 
You know, like it's not like if you watch Game of Thrones, so like Theodore, Theodore <laughs> Greyjoy, whether I'm a Stark or a Greyjoy, you can actually be both. You can yes. be Asian and you can be Australian. Mm. So, and that's what it makes it unique. But also the Asian Australian identity is unique in itself is, is what you want it to be. You know what I mean? So mm. people always ask me, so how do you actually classify who's Asian? Self-identification for me is key. So mm-hmm. if you self-identify, so for example, this year in the awards, we have our f- we have our first Assyrian Australian winner. Mm. So you know, people thought Assyria, yeah, that's Iran. You know, like in the Middle East, never thought that would be a part of Asia. But this individual sees himself as part of this community. Mm. Who am I to stop him? Mm-hmm. Who are we to stop him to say that he can't apply? Right. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, for, for for me, it's more like that identity is how we shape it, and it's more powerful now. Be- and some people would argue, some of the critics or some of the naysayers might say, oh, that's a terminology that's been created by, um, you know, um, Australia or, wh- or, or white Australia, you know. That, that's what the label that they gave us. Mm. But I think what's happening right now is all of us, everyone sitting on this couch behind the scenes here at this studio, we're reclaiming that. Mm. We're calling ourselves that now. We're proud to call ourselves that. And I think, you know, the pandemic uh, – when it happened in 2020, really accelerated that. I think so. so. It, it sort of gave um, not just the movement, um, you know, energy and fuel to actually do better, but it gave Cal a purpose. It gave what ANU sort of a purpose to support this center. Mm. You know, you know, ANU realized that this issue is not just a community issue; it's a national issue. Mm-hmm. We have to get it right because if we don't, our country could be bit, could be worse off. Mm. Because we talk about the Asian century, we talk about um, our multicultural diversity, but we have here a, a community and an and a, and a, and a ecosystem that's completely, not completely, but sometimes underutilized and underappreciated and often under, unrecognized. Mm. So I think the awards is an important component of giving people that platform that they could be themselves, you know, be proud of their achievements. Because sometimes, you know, as so with Asian Australians, we don't chest beat, as you said, mm. can. We don't do that. We should sometimes we have to picking the right moment that's where like oh, this, you know, when to do it not always like do it yeah. like you know like <laughs> like captain america or the, hulk, or the hulk or whatever you know like yeah. but you have to sort of pick your moments yeah. you know and i think we have to do a bit of that and you have to do you know the stuff that we're also very good at and we shouldn't see it as a weakness yeah. i think sometimes we say to ourselves you know Heads down, bums up. That's going to get us ahead. Okay. Yeah, sure. And I say to people, the leadership journey is long, right? It's long and arduous. Mm. Your skills and your expertise gets you to a certain level. But once you hit that sort of senior executive level, it's more than your skills. Yeah. It's more than your skills. It's more than your expertise. It requires a bit of personality, your networks, you know, your sponsors and your mentors, Mm. all the things that we all know about. Mm. But that might get you through the door. Mm -hmm. But what is going to make you stay there? Mm. is it comes back to your skills and expertise. Mm. That's what makes you last. That's what makes you, you know, like continue on. So you might have like great personality or you're very like, you know, endearing and you're very sort of like brings people together and you're great, you know, you can work the room and all that. But if you're shit, you've got no skills, you can't go, you can't get very far. So the awards is obviously not the only thing that you're involved in. We Mm. talked about cow and ANU and all this sort of stuff, but you know, we kind of like to wind it all the way back Mm. and get to know you because, you know, for those who don't know Jayung and, you know, I was certainly at that point, you know, a few months back when we were sort of launching this whole thing was like, who is this Jayung Lo? (laughs) (laughs) Who's this JYL that everyone talks about? (laughs) This acronym. And, um, you know, sort of the more I sort of dug into understanding who you were and obviously you're very um, prolific on LinkedIn and, you know, sort of share a lot of your thoughts about that. Um, It's, I think it's always important for people to understand your backstory and sort Mm. of where it came about. So do you want to tell us a little bit Uh, where do you want to start? Well, do you want to start, 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 start like, you know, do you want to start like five generations up? Or do you want to start, <laughs> no, how do you want to start? We'll start, you know? we'll start with you. Um, let's, no, maybe not baby G, but like, <laughs> but you know, sort of childhood upbringing, you know, what's family childhood life upbringing. like and then go from yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, so I was born in Melbourne. So I grew mm. up in a, in a suburb called Footscray. So mm. um, spent the first 10 years of my life in Footscray. Um, born in 1985, uh, proud uh, child of um, very hardworking migrants. Um, Chinese, so the, my, my parents were ethnic Chinese who were born in Vietnam, so, uh, and they make it very clear that they're ethnic Chinese, you know, like they, they are very proud about that. Yeah. The distinction is really important, yeah, right? Yeah, so, okay. Yep. And not only distinction about being Chinese, but where from China that we which originate province? from, you know, which province, which town, which village, they're mm. very prolific about that. So we have to make sure that we, it's in, embedded in our memory that this is where we're from, right? So, so they came here in the, you know, 1978, I believe was the time that they arrived, our family. 
um, you know, typical migrant story that they obviously had to, you know, give up everything in Vietnam. They fled Vietnam due to the war. Mm. Um, and uh, But even in Vietnam, because they are ethnic Chinese, they didn't feel like they belonged in Vietnam. Mm. So, like, mm. for, so for them, moving to Australia was like second nature in a way. Like, mm-hmm. you know, they They'd already f- been through it. Yeah, they didn't feel like this is home, right? So, okay. you know, although they were born in Vietnam, because mm-hmm. they're Chinese, they didn't feel like it was home. Then mm-hmm. there was a lot of political factors at the time when they were growing up, you know, a lot of tensions in the region. Uh, you know, Vietnam was obviously, you know, splitting, mm-hmm. it split in two, and then obviously the impact of communism, China's support for communism. So there was a, very, a lot of anti-Chinese sentiment mm-hmm. in Vietnam already. So they never felt that it was home. So when they came to Australia, it was the same, it was the same feeling. Even now, they, they would hardly call themselves Australian, right? But they've been here for like 40, 40 plus years, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, you know, they started off doing, you know, many odd jobs here and there, you know, like a lot of our parents, you know, worked four or five jobs. Um, and then my dad actually uh, started a, a restaurant in Geelong. So we had a Chinese restaurant in Geelong. Oh, cool. And I wouldn't say one of the first, but certainly a prominent one because Geelong is a, uh, a fishing town. So you get a lot of like, you know, like fishermen and, you know, it's and all that, you know, that goes through Geelong. And he had this great story where um, he used to trade fried rice for abalone. <laughs> So, good deal. Yeah, a great deal. So, so, you know, so, so he would make friends with the fishermen and they would come in and grab and buy fried rice, dim sims, a typical, you know, like beef and black bean sauce, yeah. you know, like, you know, general chow chicken, whatever it is, right, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, you know, they'll, and the fishermen will just bring in, right, you know, they're the catch of the day, right? So, and they'll bring in all these abalone and he's like, I don't know what these things, what, what this stuff is, like, you know, whatever. My oh, dad so wouldn't eat it. They wouldn't eat They wouldn't know what it was. They'll just oh, bring it in, wow. right? They'll just bring it in as part of their, oh. like, catch, right? And then my dad's like, oh, this is interesting. And then my dad was like switched on. He knew what he was doing, right? He was, he was and this is the power of Asian strategy <laughs> is you're five steps ahead, yeah. right? So he's already worked out the final goal is I'm going to sit there with this abalone in my kitchen, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, he's already had a plan, right? So <laughs> he visualized himself eating it. Yeah, <laughs> he was. He was visualizing. He was five steps ahead. He was. He knew what the outcome was, my dad. So he told these fishermen guys, right? He's like, what, oh, what's that? And he's like, oh, I don't know, just some crap we got, you know, like, you know, some, you know, like mollusks or shellfish, you know, don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. My dad's like, you know what, mate? I'm going to trade you, right? 10 abalone for one box of fried rice. <laughs> guys, like, the fisherman's like, done. <laughs> Done, done, right? So dad, dad would like, you know, grab all this abalone. And the best way to make abalone, he's taught me, is don't have to be, I mean, cause it's a delicacy, right? Mm. We all know it's a delicacy, an expensive delicacy yes, now. Yes, he was a smart man. And the thing you do to make it, and he taught me, right? Like you don't have to f- jazz it up. So you have to, the best way to eat abalone is to slice it really thin mm. and you just dip it into hot water or a soup or a broth, right? And he was doing that every night right because these guys will come in and like you know swap fried rice for abalone right and then a couple of months later they knew they figured it out the, 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 oh, they, they figured the out they cracked the code and their dad's like fried rice for abalone again yeah and the guy's like no 10 fried rice for one abalone <laughs> my dad's like deal's over relationship's over you know like so, so how long did that last they didn't oh, I'd say about two months oh, you know okay. like so, so you got you, two months good dad, so yeah dad, dad got two months out of that but so I spent a couple of my sort of early years in Geelong mm. so I think when I was one to three because dad's restaurant mm. so I lived in Geelong but then mum didn't want me to stay in Geelong because mm. you know Geelong was pretty sort of more you know, regional yeah it? more yeah. regional back in the day you mm. know it's not like what it is now you know like that you know you would see bubble tea in Geelong now right mm. let alone a Chinese restaurant so <laughs> so it's very different back in the day so mum wanted me to you know grow and you know to have my childhood in Melbourne and um, be close to family and all that so my dad would back and forth so he would do the restaurant and then come see us and then go back to Geelong every week so I didn't see my dad a lot um, but then, so yeah, so grew up in Footscray. So spent like 10, 12 years of my life in Footscray. And then dad closed his restaurant in Geelong, um, sold his property, closed his restaurant. And then, you know, uh, then we moved to a, a suburb called Wonturner South. Okay. So, which is like far east of Melbourne, mm-hmm. you know, like that's why when I was catching the train from, from the city to Parramatta, to Parramatta, <laughs> I was getting flashbacks of, <laughs> of like me catching the train from school, right? Like back home, right? Because, you know, and I'm talking about back back in the day with One Turner South. In Melbourne, they had these three color ticket systems, right? So zone one, zone two, zone three. Mm-hmm. I was zone three, mate. <laughs> I would buy the three color ticket and I'll go all the way, right? That's how far we were. And it was literally like monocultural when I got there. Like the only Asian on the street, our family. Now it's very different. Montana mm. South is like a bit of a property gold mine now. Is for, it? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of like uh, people of uh, Chinese, Taiwanese, Indian, Sri Lankan heritage live mm. out that way now. Very different. But he moved out that way because after he closed his um, 
his uh, restaurant, he opened a, <laughs> a Cantonese opera school. What? Oh, that's dad. very esoteric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And all of his students are down there. That's why we moved down that way, right? And I'm like, what are we doing? I don't want to leave Footscray. I like pho. I, you know what I, mean? like, I don't want to leave. I don't want to go to Montana South and eat bloody fish and chips. My mum, where is my mum? You know, like, you know, you know, I'm very close to my mum. So I get really emotional talking about my mum. She's, yeah, rock of my life. She had a clothing store in Footscray. So both my parents were entrepreneurs, you know, at heart. But, you know, you did, you did odd jobs here and there to actually save up buy a house, put us through school, and then you sort of, you know, start a couple of businesses. So they have that entrepreneurial spirit. Mm. So hopefully that could transcend down to me over the, new, over the near future. This episode is produced and brought to you by Social Wave. Social Wave is a strategic content marketing agency helping businesses grow revenue using video, podcasts, and SEO. Head on over to socialwave.com.au to find out more. Now back to the show. We transferred a lot through, through schools, you know, went to um, a couple of like, you know, Catholic schools at the start and then, um, you know, not doing our Asian, our Asian family proud, like our Asian community proud. Like I sucked at school. You weren't the academic. I was a Bijan. I wasn't even a Bijan. I was a Dijon. I <laughs> Dijon. <laughs> wasn't even a Bijan, right? You know, definitely not an Asian. You know, definitely not an Asian. Not an Asian. You know, I think C was my C or D was that my, was the pinnacle what, of your yeah, C Asian, Dijon, and even an Asian, especially in maths. <laughs> in maths, right? I'm breaking stereotypes. Hey, now. hey, I can relate. I'm the same. <laughs> I was a Asian for maths. I sucked at maths, right? And and. And, um, and so, but you know, you get pressured, right? Cause all your Asian friends are doing so well in maths, mm. right? And they're doing so well in science. And you're like, I gotta live up to the, I gotta live up to the reputation. I gotta live up to the stereotypes, <laughs> you know what I mean? The first year in year seven was pretty good. Cause I was in the middle of the CBD. So it was quite diverse. See, a lot of like, a lot of my Asian friends. So we sort of grew mm. up together and all that. But year eight and nine, that was tough. Like that was just like out there in one turn of South metro like out of suburbs you were still the, I was the novelty the, asian uh, novelty asian okay right and you know not just the novelty asian camp but the novelty asian who sucked <laughs> in academia in academia <laughs> who sucked in academia so but the one thing that i was very good at um and it carried me through high school was debating so i did a lot of debating from year eight onwards right um and that carried me through and i was you know like two Asian, Asian to actually make it into like selective school, right? So my parents, typical Asian parents, will put us through tutoring, right? Mm. Or you know, get me to do scholarship tests, and I sucked. My sister got a scholarship, so you know, she's <laughs> obviously the brains of the family. So I had no pathway into a selective school, right? So, so my parents, you know, God bless them, you know, you know, they put all their savings together, and they sent me to a private school called Hunting Tower, which is so private that not even pe- not many people know about it, right? Mm. Um, it was a very small school. So when you had like, for example, 40 year 12s now, you're like, oh, it's very small, very small, but a very high performing academic school. So my, and it was also pretty affordable for a private school. So, so mum and dad sent me to Hunting Tower, which was in a suburb called Mount Waverley. That's where I sort of, you know, found myself, you know, in a way that um, I still did debating. I really enjoyed that. Um, but then, you know, when you're in year 11, you pick subjects, right? So, you know, all my friends in Chinese school, all my friends in tutoring, they were like, oh yeah, we, you know, we have to do the Asian five. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, the Asian five, you guys might know this, right? Yeah. The Asian five. Mm-hmm. So what, what is that? That is accounting, mm-hmm. right? Uh, maths methods, which is like, you know, like mid-level maths, specialist maths, which is advanced maths. Right. I'm not sure what you guys call it. In it's probably like three unit for us. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah. A, yeah specialist it's like, maths. Yeah. yeah. Uh, physics, oh, which mm. killed me <laughs> and chemistry. So that's the Asian fire. Right? Mm. So I'm like, you know what? Pressure's on. I'm taking this on, right? Year 11, <laughs> taking this on. Reality sunk in when my midterm, my mid-year exams, I got 20% for chemistry. Oof. Oof. I got 10% for physics. Oh. Ouch. Right? And then like maths was like, I don't know, like 30 or whatever. And then my careers teacher, bless him as well. He goes to me, he goes, mate, you can't do this. <laughs> You can't, you can't do this. He gave you no hope. <laughs> he goes, mate, you can't do this. You know, like, you need to reassess yourself, right? So as a child though, growing up, one of the one of the real passions for me was history. I loved history. So when, you know, kids were reading about, you know, fairy tales or whatever, I read history. So I would read like, you know, world history or Chinese history. So I realized, all right, okay, um, maybe I should choose history in, in year 11, right? So I switched. So I kept maths because you need maths in a way that you needed to get through, you know, it gives you more options when you go to university. But I picked up uh, international relations, so international studies and history. I regret not picking up legal studies. Uh, I still kept accounting because I felt like, you know, there was some sort of pressure. <laughs> 
that I needed to do <laughs> so, commerce, Some right? Some residual trauma. Yeah, because everybody, you know, everybody in our sort of like couple of years ahead of us, we're all doing commerce. Hmm. Everybody was taking up a commerce degree. So I'm like, I can't miss out. So, yeah, so, so I'm like, so I kept accounting, right? And yeah, and that was not, that did not end well. Right? <laughs> Come year 12. So, so year 11, picked up all these humanities subjects, did well in English, did well in, uh, in history, did well in international studies, sucked at maths, right? I still did it, like mid maths, like maths methods, which is like the intermediate level maths. Still did it because I needed it to get into commerce, sucked. Um, sucked at, um, at, at accounting, like... <laughs> Do you dare divulge what you got? <laughs> no, there was like. Thank God, Davey's not on this. No, no, there, there was there was a nosebleeds thinking there, about this. There was a C. There was a C somewhere. <laughs> there was a C somewhere. A C and a B, or maybe a B was probably the best I did. But like, no, that was not good. But what really carried me through was Chinese. So oh. Chinese second language. Like, okay. So I, I that was probably the subject that I was really disappointed in because I, I worked my butt off for that subject because I didn't have Chinese at school. So like you had to do Saturday school and I had to code switch as well. Because when I was growing up, we studied Cantonese. So Cantonese was the dialect. Right. So you know, and I spoke Cantonese, traditional Chinese writing. I was I was the king of that. I was killing it right. <laughs> But then like when I was 14, right, the curriculum changed. All of a sudden this is Mandarin. I'm like, what is this oh. shit? Right? And I'm like, you know, and I'm like, what is this? Like, I walk into a classroom and they started talking about, you know, Mandarin. And I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> I'm in the wrong school. So like, you know, then like my parents, you know, blessed them again. They went and borrowed like Journey to the West from CCTV. <laughs> <laughs> and, they're like, and they're like, watch this. You know, like, learning oh. from monkey. <laughs> Dubs and everything. No, no, it was not. It was like it was 19, 1988, 1986, sorry, 1986 version of Journey to the West done by CCTV. So China, like mm. real authentic man. I think I watched right? the same one as you. Yeah. you I reckon you might have, right? I reckon yeah. all of us who went through this or, yep. or, or worked it and um, watched it, right? So my parents are like, watch this. Learn You're Mandarin, <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, fine, I'll watch it. And you know, I got a couple of A's there, you know, for Chinese, but I didn't get the score that I wanted. So mm. I, I remember like sitting in the middle of the park near our um, local area in our, in our neighborhood and just crying because I really wanted to really? do well. I really wanted to do well. It was that important to- It was that important to me. Like, it's part of me, right? Part of my identity, part of who I was. You know, as you, as you both would have realized, I've still kept my Chinese name, you know? Mm. And there's a story about that as well, which mm. I'll share later on. Um, we didn't take up an English name because we were so proud of our identity and it's mm. important because I've always believed that, you know, besides the, the gift of life that your parents give you, especially in Chinese culture, your name is the next important thing mm. that they give you because there's meaning behind. Yeah, there's a lot of thought behind it. A lot of thought. A yeah. lot of thought. Yep. And there's also a lot of thought about because it's your name is really what they hope you to be. Yes. Their aspiration for you, I'll right? I'll share my name in a second you find out. <laughs> God, this is perfect for you. <laughs> but sorry, go on. <laughs> and, and um, you know, so we didn't change that, right? So I was really disappointed. But but it but because of uh, I did Chinese because I was um, I'm an ABC, I, I flunked the system in a way that I did Chinese as a second language. <laughs> so that got boosted. So if you get like 35, <laughs> if you got 35 you got out of 50, I, I went up. I'm like 49, and I'm like, oh, nice. <laughs> so that that carried me through to 90 on my ATA. Oh, right? wow, yeah, really? Yeah. So it carried me, right? So, you know, history, as I mentioned, history and international relations, I did well. Mm. English, I was okay. Chinese, you know, did, you know not, as, not as well as I wanted to, but it, because it boosted, yep. it carried me up. Because the government at the time wanted to encourage people to do a second language. Mm. So right. any second language had a bit of a boost. Got it. Uh, accounting, dragged me down, <laughs> dragged me down. I did IT as well for some really weird reason. That was okay. It wasn't too bad. And my parents, especially my mum, right? My mum's like, I don't care what you do. I don't care if it's I don't care if it's a bachelor of cleaning. You go to Melbourne Uni. I don't care what it she is. She just wants you there. She just Melbourne wants me there. She's like, you go in there. And you know, this is a reputation. Yeah, reputation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I think, yeah, look, I think Victoria is blessed, same as New South Wales. Like we've got some great universities, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, you know, I, I actually wanted A and U, you know, because um, I had aspirations of being a diplomat. So an A and U was obviously the university for public policy and for international law. So I had that aspiration, but I we we didn't have the, the financial sort of like backing to sort of and I wasn't smart enough to get a scholarship. Mm. So that was out. <laughs> that was out. So so um and um so we chose chose Melbourne. So I picked um I picked a Bachelor of Arts. I'm a proud BA graduate. Nice. Proud. Yep. And then, you know, so my parents are like, good. My mum especially, she's like, You go to Melbourne. I used all my savings. You know, everything else that I've done, you know, you go to Melbourne, you're right. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, but it's like the crappiest degree. <laughs> I'm not doing like a double degree or a law or a commerce or an engineering or a science. I'm doing arts. She's like, I don't care. You go to Melbourne Uni. 
Okay, cool. You know, it's funny you were talking about awards, right? And I've never really won many awards in my life. That's the irony of all this. Like, I really value awards, but I've never like won much in my life. I think the last award, of, this is still like, this is still the last award that I've actually won was the debating award in year 12. So I had leadership aspirations already, right? I wanted to be a leader and I wanted to sort of do my part and learn the skills of leadership. So I sort of put myself up for prefect, you know, um, didn't get it. And I remember like either the principal or, the, or one of the teachers, I forgot who it was, it's been a long time ago. And I asked him, I said, so can you give me some feedback? Well, you know, I just wanna know what happened. And he said to me, and I remember this to this day, to the day I die, he said to me, he goes, mate, Asians have no leadership skills. That's what he said to me. Whoa. To me. Yeah, yeah, he goes, you, you, they, the, yeah, you, don't, you don't exhibit leadership skills. That's 2002. Awesome kid. Oh my God. Yeah, so I mean, so I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't blame him. Like, it cut deep. Like, yeah. you know, I don't blame him at the time because, you know, you you're taken back by that, right? But this guy is also like from South Africa, apartheid, right? So I'm like, oh. well, that's where he was from. He was South African. Um, so obviously had a certain view about diversity mm. and about, you know, race and all that. So but that's what he said. You know, I, I didn't know how to react at the time. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, um, I thought it might, it might be, a, you know, a, a thing because a lot of the people who got it, who were prefects, they were actually there from like prep. So I thought it might be just a, mm -hmm. some sort of- Tenure a, thing. Tenure, yeah, yeah, something that I wasn't a part of. So, but the sweetest revenge for me was um, returning to the school uh, 10 years later um, as the deputy mayor of Monash, oh. right? Because I was, because I was, yeah. that area that I went to school was an area that also, that the local council that I represented also mm -hmm. was, you know, it was it was in part of that community. Mm -hmm. Like those, those borders are there and those, ba you know, those boundaries are there. Mm. And I remember like they invited me to do the commencement address, right? And that 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 teacher and principal was still there. He was still he there. Was still there. Oh he my was god. Still there, was right? he in the assembly when you were oh, addressed? He was there. He was Did he there, say yeah. something to you afterwards? Uh, uh no. He tried to he tried to like not, Ooh. you know. He was lobbying me for a, he was lobbying me for a swimming pool, right? And the thing is about like private schools shouldn't be telling you yeah. know, a government body how, you know, where to spend where yeah. to spend your money or how yeah. invest in a you know if i had money i'll be investing in swimming pools in public school not mm. private school right mm -hmm. but anyway he was trying his luck he was lobbying you know blah 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 and i said it you know and i and i look back and like at the commencement address and it was very different there was more asians there was more diverse more representative and i said that story in in my in my commencement address oh. and like some of the teachers there who uh, who taught me they never knew about it because i didn't say it back then you kept it to yourself i kept it to myself but i was in a position now that i can you yeah, know what I mean? Wow. And I said it and it, yeah, it's silence in the room, you know? I said, mm -hmm. and I said to people, if you don't make it now, if you don't make it now, don't be disappointed because you can, mm. Mm. you can, you know mm. what I mean? You can come You're back. You're the living embodiment yeah, of it. Yeah, you can come back, right? Mm. So don't be, don't be disappointed that you don't achieve that at a very young age. You can learn leadership skills. You can adopt it. You can, you know, be flexible, right? You can adopt these skills along the way and you can still dream big regardless of how much adversity or how much disappointment that you get. So it's not the end. So that was really cool. That was great. Mm. You know, for me, it was like a closure in yeah. some way, right? Yeah. So um, haven't been back to the school since. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't been invited back since. Is it? I don't, probably not. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if he's still there. But did but. you use that as fuel um, at the time? I mean, obviously you would have been very confused, but you know, how did you, <sighs> once you had time to process it, what did you do? No, I think, you know, I worked on my strengths. So, you know, sort of focused on debating. I was a pretty good athlete. So I was very like, you know, for a scrawny Asian kid, I was pretty like, I was a good middle distance runner. Well, you know, we, we competed in state state athletics. So mm. I was sort of focusing on things that I really enjoyed, um, good at. So- You shrugged I, it off basically. I, I did, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like, you know, and um, I didn't actually expect to get 93 on my ATR because I, I, you know, I had a pretty good year 12. Like, you know, I enjoyed myself and you went to schoolies and I'm not sure if they still do that now, but <laughs> went to the Gold Coast, right? And I love that because like, I was underage, right? <laughs> at the Gold Coast and like, literally couldn't get anywhere you know and then my mate's like hey do you want to borrow my brother's like id kevin tran 21 <laughs> no one can tell the difference right you know <laughs> and, 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 and i did it i did it like 21 year old kevin tran right walked into this surface paradise you know, paradise like bar, right? and that was a day that was like 2002 right like you know and um but no so i had a good time in year 12 i really you know had a good group of friends and again not many of them were asian 
So I didn't expect to do like that well. You know, I think, yeah, 93, I was pretty happy with, but you know, some of my relatives to these days, like, what happened to the other 6%? Like, <laughs> what happened there? And I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> it's always like that, glass up empty type yeah, approach. Exactly. Okay. But getting to university, you know, I majored in um, politics and um, Asian studies. So I had aspirations to be a diplomat because mm. I think, you know, growing up in Australia, you always feel that, you know, we all, we, no, no doubt that the both of you and your listeners would have experienced this as well. Mm. You never feel like you truly belong, mm. right? So you've always tried to find acceptance. So when people talk about the A word, assimilation, I was looking for acceptance. Mm. You know what I mean? But different. It's a different word from my perspective. I want people to recognize me for who I am, mm. not to be somebody that I wasn't, right? So, you know, back in the day, I'm, I'm saying I'm saying like I'm really old back in the day. Like people used to dye their hair. Dragon Ball was a huge thing. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like people used to dye their hair blonde and, you know, have the trunks hair. And I couldn't, again, you know, like being a Bijan or a Cesian or whatever mm. it is. I, I had wavy hair, so I couldn't pull it off. I couldn't pull that off. You can right? do this. I couldn't yeah. do that, right? So, you know, everybody was dyeing their hair and all that. And I didn't do any of that because I wanted to be myself right um and so i was looking for acceptance so i had two options to fulfill my australianness to actually feel fulfill my desire to be australian or to be recognized as an australian and there are only two ways of doing that is to represent represent <laughs> represent your country right and there are only two ways of doing that one is an olympian Yep. I was never going to do that. <laughs> right? Just not even with the middle distance I running was pretty, career. I was pretty good, right? Yep. But I wasn't at that, okay. that yeah. level, right? Okay. Second was to be a diplomat, to represent your country abroad. So I had my heart set on doing that. That was a big part of the decision-making process, like a factor to go, I want to be a diplomat, largely because I was looking to, you know, essentially become Australian, like to be accepted as Australian. But I mean, were there other factors? Uh, no, well, I think that was a big part. I think for me, um, it was trying to find that, um, you know, that, that acceptance, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of that recognition that I am Australian and who tells you that is people overseas. So if you're like, you know, representing Australia and then you're, you know, serving overseas or abroad and people are like, oh, so you're from Australia. And it's, I was looking for that. Got it. Yeah. That's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, getting into DFAT was tough, you know, like people, you need to have like multiple languages, double degrees. I didn't have a law degree or anything like that. So, you know, I went through the grad program and I applied and, you know, did okay, got into like interview, but never broke through. So I sort of dropped it in a way that, oh, this is too hard, you know, tried it a couple of times, didn't work, mm. whatever. Let's do something else. Graduated. Um, and then my career sort of started in the not-for-profit space. So I worked in a, in a little um, not-for-profit called... Um, the economic, uh, the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria, ECCV. So it was a not-for-profit that advocated for multicultural communities in Victoria. That kick-started my journey and my passion for cultural diversity. Mm -hmm. So it started from there. So what were some of the um, experiences, I guess, between that and, you know, we fast forward to now with Cal and everything that you're doing here, you know, if we sort of would have condense it into sort of the highlights or some of the formative events or milestones, what would they be? I think with multicultural communities and those from diverse backgrounds, again, you know, they're always trying to find that acceptance, you know, trying to find that sort of what's our place in Australia? What's our contribution? How can we contribute? Um, and, you know, it's sort of like for me, that's always been a pinnacle for my career into a, a policy area that I was very passionate about. So when I moved around in my career from not-for-profit to government, you know, I worked in sport, uh, for a little bit for one year. Um, that was a ex really strange experience, <laughs> we can, which we can talk about, yeah. you know, and then working in, you know, a, you know, government again, and then working in entrepreneurship and all that. I think multicultural affairs and cultural diversity was always a part of me. So everywhere I went, it came with me. So, you know, when I was, uh, as a local government councillor, when I was a, when I served as a city of Monash local government councillor, that was a key part of my legacy, you know, mm. what I did down there in that community. So it's always been a part of me. So again, the decision to enter politics was the end to find acceptance. Because mm. then, you know, you, you go and talk to voters and you say, please vote for me or, um, you know, support me. These are my ideas. You're looking for recognition. Like, so my whole life has been looking for recognition. Mm. So recognition as an Australian, but mm. also furthermore recognition now, now recognition as an Asian Australian, right? Mm. And also finding our place in the social and national fabric of Australia. So that's, I think for me, the big driver in terms of what we're doing at Cal, mm -hmm. in terms of what we're doing with the ANU, in terms of the work we're doing around how do we increase more Asian Australians in leadership positions, 
it's 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 that acceptance and also that recognition and a big way to giving back is actually being in a leadership position where you can steer the ship not just being a passenger mm-hmm. but actually steering the ship and steering the direction for the better yep. and that has always been a big part of me in terms of what i wanted to do that was part one of our episode with Jay Young. Make sure you tune into next week's episode for part two, where we talk about what the future holds for Asian Australians and Jay Young's mission with the Centre for Asian Australian Leadership, aka CAL. Thanks for listening.